Professor Musa Esad, when you were the controller and auditor general in the Tanzanian government, you appeared not to quite get along with most of the parliamentarians, with some even saying that they were not willing to work with you. Take me back then. What was happening? We had a problem, and the problem started with my interview in New York at the UN Radio. Uh, and in that interview, I was asked a question. If recommendations are not implemented, what were my views? My views were, and I answered that question to say, if my recommendation were not implemented, that indicated a weakness on the part of parliament to follow up implementation by the government of my recommendation. And for reasons that are unknown to me, it was interpreted as a contempt of parliament. So why, why was that contempt? You search me, I didn't know. I, until today, I don't know. And that is where I was really flabbergasted. I got in touch with the main adversary in parliament and we agreed that we're going to talk these things over. And the date agreed was, I think, 13th of January. The agreement I had, the initial agreement I had with my adversary in parliament was thrown out because he went to the media. And I told his PA, if he goes to the media, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. As you know, eventually I was uh, called to the parliamentary committee, disciplinary committee, and I was very well prepared for that. I put a very uh, strong defense. None of that became transparent. Nobody knows what happened. It wasn't made public. And the reason was I was told it was because it was quasi-judicial. So that conversation could not be public. Now, you have recently come out saying that you feel there are officials who need to go through a lifestyle audit. Tell us about that. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, in terms of lifestyle audit, the starting point will have the executive. And the executive, I mean the president himself the vice president, the prime minister, the entire cabinet, the chief secretary, the head of uh, the pillars, I mean, the speaker, the chief justice, uh, I think the controller on the general himself, the head of immigration, the head of major departments like prisons, the head of armed forces, these are the people who in the first place is well going to put this in, in phases, phase one will be this. And then phase two, maybe we go for the MPs, we go for permanent secretaries, and maybe regional commissioners. That will be for phase two. And phase three, we go for everybody else up to the level of district directors. I think the National Audit Office had the mandate to do that, even as of now. But to make people a little bit comfortable, we could pair the National Audit Office with the Ethics Secretariat. And the two organizations could decide on the sample and execute that, the, the audit and then finally discuss it together and then release it to the public with their recommendation. It just takes confidence. It can be initiated today. Because as far as I know, the Audit Act, Public Audit Act, uh, uh, mandates the controller on the to perform any other types of audit. And the lifestyle audit is one type of audit he could undertake. So what you need is building competencies to be able to do that. The bad decisions you say that the government has made in the past. Give me a few examples. Uh, if a government conducts itself in such a way, it isn't on the margins of criminality, then everything will be fair for anybody to do. Uh, for example, if the government uh, frames charges on individuals, it refuses bail or it prefers charges that refuse or uh, result in people not getting their bail, uh, it pursues behavior like that, like, for example, plea bargaining, where you charge somebody with, say, 58 charges, and then they accept one charge and they pay a lot of money. So that kind of behavior from where I'm coming from is close to criminal behavior. Number two, selective punishment. When you say something is wrong, then the punishment has got to be uniform across the board. If you are selective, 
then people will see that you are not being fair to everybody else. And that, of course, brings up uh, corruption, corruption as well. And number three, from where I'm coming from, is the legislative system is not very effective. Uh, for example, charges could be incompetent, but be taken all, all the way ac across the system. Evidence could be not admissible, and they'll be entertained. Or the prosecution will say, we are going through investigation for long periods of time, and people are in bail. And you can't allow that because you are denying people freedom. One aspect that enables corruption is this air of confidentiality in government. So if everything was shared publicly, then we would see who, who said what, for what reason, and then we could assign responsibility. Right now, we cannot do that. And that, for me, is a big problem. As a controller and auditor general, there's a point you would have to be in contempt of parliament. Who do you think was behind this? I can now tell it was the executive. Because towards the end, three emissaries came to me, all with the same message and telling me they were sent by the same person. And that person wanted me to resign. And I said, no, I'm not going to resign because one, I believe I did nothing wrong. And number two, resignation is completely out of question. And number four, if I had done anything wrong, the constitution is very clear. You take me to a panel of judges and I can defend myself at that time. And they will decide if I did anything wrong and then a decision can, take, can be taken at that time. None of that was done, but I stood to my position on those three conditions and eventually I think the executive decided that I needed to go and they just pushed me aside unconstitutionally. <music>